Hi. Today we're going to look at this bench power supply. It's made by the brand Longwi or Longwi, I'm not sure. But um, this is the 30 volt 10 amp model, the PS3010. There is a 5 amp model as well, which is a bit lower cost. But 30 volts at 10 amps would probably power most things that you're ever going to want to use on the bench. Now, this is relatively low cost, so it's fairly limited in its feature set. But I've actually been using this for about six months now. And it has been featured on a few videos. I've just never explicitly called this out as a particular unit because I've not even opened it up to see what the construction's like and to see how safe it really is. So here it is on Banggood, currently retailing for $93, but if you look for a discount code, you'll probably find a 15 or 20% off, which gets it even cheaper. You can choose what type of power lead is provided with it, but it does just have a standard IEC socket on the back which means that you can use your own power cord and then you can use something either more substantial or more suitable cable length. And if you have a look at the specifications, you can see here 30 volts, 10 amps. I think the specs here are a little bit optimistic. So 0.1% plus 10 millivolts or 0.1% plus 10 milliamps accuracy. I'm not sure how true that really is. Similar for under load and also ripple less than 10 millivolts. That seems highly optimistic, and they've not said whether that's at 20 megahertz or what frequency. Efficiency, greater than 80%. I can quite believe that. It's a switching power supply, so the unit is quite lightweight. And then they've also done sort of high pot tests. So 1.5 kilovolt isolation input to output. 1.5 kV input to the chassis. And then output to the housing, 500 volts AC. So fairly standard figures. On the rear of the device is an 80 millimeter fan. Now I've not actually heard this spin up, but with the size, it's probably not horrendously noisy when it's running at full speed. I don't know if it's speed controlled or just uh, at a threshold it suddenly turns on. We've got a fused IEC connector and then the switch to switch between 110 and 220 volts. On the side are some vents that help draw in the air. And this is about 27 centimeters or 11 inches in length on the top we've got a carry handle and on the bottom are four rubber feet and the fit and finish is not too bad actually the painted metal is actually very nice and there's not really anything too much to complain about it is pretty lightweight so i don't know how much heat sinking we've got going on in here what we might do is take the lid off and under load have a look at what the temperatures are looking like now the one thing that i do like very much about this power supply is that the display is really nice and bright. So if I turn it on, you've got a really crisp, clear display that is really quite high contrast. It looks really nice by eye and very, very visible. You've got your standard constant voltage or constant current LEDs on the front, and that's about all there is really to it. So uh, if we turn up the voltage, you can see it updates straight away. There's no sloping up, it just bang straight there. So we've got the power supply hooked up to the multimeter and also to the DC load. This is a new one that you've not seen before. A very nice piece of equipment. So I'll do a review on this in the coming weeks. And the multimeter is connected directly to the output terminals. I've not connected up the sense terminals. So we've just got these two thick wires between the DC load and the power supply. So we'll just do a quick spot check on the voltages. 5.97, 5.97. 4973, remembering that this tallied up exactly with Ian's DC precision reference. So this reading is pretty much bang on, and we're seeing a similar reading here with no load. At about 14.72, we're also seeing the same numbers on these, and at maximum output voltage, 32.07, and we're just off by 10 millivolts on here. So let's add a load. We've got one amp set. Let's turn that on. And we're still seeing the same voltage here, just slightly different in terms of what's on the front panel here, just down by about 20 millivolts, but nothing too concerning. But I think that does make it out of spec to what they say on the website already. So you can see, you know, these numbers never really going to meet those high specifications that they had on the spec sheet. Let's turn up the load slightly, Let's set it to 2 amps, so 64 watts. Again, no real problem, it's just dropped very slightly, but 2 amps, absolutely fine. Let's try it at 5 amps, so 160 watts. The fan has just started to spin up on the DC load, but I'm not hearing anything from the power supply. Again, just dropped very slightly, but really nothing to be concerned about. I'm just going to leave this for a few minutes just to see if this gets warm. 
So you can hear the fan possibly spinning on the power supply. It's not horrendously offensive, but it is just set on a threshold. So I hear it cycling. It probably comes on for about 20 seconds and then off for about 40 or 50 seconds. Uh, I haven't seen any indication that it's starting to struggle. The voltage output still absolutely fine. And the fact that it's cycling suggests that at 5 amps or 160 watts, we're not getting close to the limit of what this is able to provide. Now, before we take it up to 10 amps, we will just check some of the other voltages and just see how they look in terms of regulation, um, just because there is the potential that at the highest current we might take out the power supply and stop it working. So let's have a quick look at some of the others. 18.83, and we're pretty much okay, just off very slightly. Uh, we get losing a little bit more between the PCB and the front panel terminals here. And we'll try setting the current to the full 10 amps. So let's see what happens. There we go. So a bit of voltage drop in the cable again, but uh, not too bad. It is happily providing that 10 amps. Let's see if we can look what the ripple is. So the AC voltage on component on here. Looks like it's settling at about 250 millivolts ripple at full load. Let's turn up the voltage all the way up to 30. So this is the full, in fact it's slightly over 300 watts. Let's take it down to 300. Also the DC load is only a 300 watt load. Noise has actually done, gone down a little bit. And we'll just leave this here for a few minutes again to see if we have any problems. So that's been another 5 minutes. No dramas so far. The fan is on, on both of these units at 100%. So these are just continually kicking air through them. But I'm not seeing any problems with it. There's not been any uh, horrible noises or smells or anything. So I don't think it's overheating. One other thing I did want to have a quick look at is nominally it has this little bar between the negative output and mains ground. Now that means that um, you know the output is referenced to mains earth. It also means that it would eliminate any stray voltages that you would get coupled across the transformer from it being a switch mode power supply. So what I'm going to quickly do is just remove this link and measure the output voltage with respect to mains earth. I suspect we'll see something at about 90 or 100 volts like we do on most switch mode converters. But let's have a little look and see what it actually does. So we've got about 27 volts between the output and mains earth. Let's have a little look how much current is actually behind that. And so measuring the current between the output and mains earth, we're getting about 120 microamps, which is just a little bit higher than we'd like to see. Um, but most of the time you're going to have that earth bar in place to link the negative to the mains earth. That does mean we've got something like a 1.5 or 2.2 nanofad safety capacitor across the switching converter transformer in this device. We'll have a look inside in a minute to verify that. But the overall implication is, if you're going to hook this up to some sensitive electronics, you do want to have that earth bar in place to reference the output to mains earth. If you have two of these units side by side and you were trying to get a dual rail, so a negative and a positive rail, you would need to remove that earth bar on one of those units, but it would be referenced by mains earth by the other power supply. So what does your money get you? Well, pretty much what you'd expect for the money. Uh, the first thing is, I forgot to mention that it has a USB connector on the front for charging your items or for plugging in stuff like uh, Raspberry Pi or whatever. That does actually have a dedicated AC to DC converter which is powering that USB connector. So that is completely unrelated to the rest of the electronics on here. So the main controller IC is just sitting here. It's an SG3525 Pulse Width Modulator IC. A very common device. Can be used for a whole host of things. But it has quite a lot of modular features in it. And I think we saw it on the 150 volt power supply as well. It allows you to do quite a wide range of control with it. In this case they're doing flyback control. And what they've got is the big power transformer. This is our 300 watt transformer, although it is still quite warm from that test, despite having the fan cooling. And then this is what's actually doing the conversion. We've got a much smaller transformer here. Now what this is doing is this is taking the outputs from this chip, boosting it up to do the gate drive of these MOSFETs on the side, because these are sitting up at high voltage. Um, you can't just drive it directly from the chip itself. So these are getting the gate drive all the way up to the 350 volts that's coming from the mains. Now the actual power comes in from the IEC connector into the filter. So it is filtered, uh, a common mode choke, a couple of capacitors across it, a um, thermistor here for inrush current. 
a couple of big capacitors here, uh, off-brand, but um, the 350 volts comes through this current transformer, and the current transformer is probably doing the peak current mode control of the converter to make sure that we're not saturating the transformers or damaging the MOSFETs. Then that goes straight into the transformer and into the switching, and our output comes out filtered by this inductor, and then we've got our secondary side filtering and capacitors and all that stuff on this side. We've also got another switch mode controller, so a separate bridge rectifier for this and a couple more capacitors going into a Power Integrations TNY switch mode power supply controller IC. Now Power Integrations are a big player in the switch mode controller IC and in a few months we're going to be doing some episodes on switch mode converter design. We're going to do an AC to DC converter, we're going to wind our own coil and everything so stay tuned for that but we're going to start off by using one of these Power Integrations ICs. And this is just providing the control voltage for all of the electronics in the system. So you can see here we've got the little transformer here that is being driven by this power integrations IC. We've got our um, little capacitor here which is going across the transformer so that will be contributing towards some of that leakage that we're seeing on the front panel. And just on the edge of the board down here we've got three safety capacitors, each 3 kV rated, all connected in series. Not the optimal layout, but that's given us about 1.1 nanofarads of capacitance across the primary to secondary of the high power uh, controller. So that's contributing as well to our leakage currents that we're seeing on the connector at the front. Here we've got our main two switching transistors that are driving the flyback transformer. They're both mounted on heat sinks, but infuriatingly they're quite wonky, but they are soldered into the PCB. In the PCB there's a hole in the bottom which you can see, I've just shone a torch underneath. That's allowing some airflow up through the heatsink, but the fan is right there so the airflow is going in this direction. I'm not sure how much you'll actually get flowing up through the board because the fan is going to be drawing air across the board rather than allowing natural convection up through the PCB. There is another transistor here, I'm not quite sure what that one's driving, but both of these have thermistors on the heatsink so clearly the fan is being turned on once we reach a threshold on the temperature of those heat sinks. In terms of the rest of the stuff, it's pretty much what you'd expect. Not the most spectacular construction, but nothing too alarming. We've got isolation slots where they're needed in the PCB. We're using off-brand components for things like the capacitors, but again, that's probably what you'd expect at this price point. Um, things like this would be a little bit nicer if there was a better way of doing things. This one is fine, it's sitting off the PCB so that you get some convection around the resistor. If it is dissipating 5 watts then this is going to get quite warm. But if you happen to have a power supply that had been dropped during shipping or something like that, this would be very easy to bend out of place and maybe it could end up sitting against the AC to DC converter for example. Not ideal, uh, but pretty much par for the course really for this type of device. Again, there's been a resistor which is mounted. Uh, it looks like this was supposed to be a TO220 type resistor and they've just put in a quarter watt resistor because that's all they needed. Uh, not the end of the world, really. Um, but yeah, a few components mounted underneath, a couple of wire around resistors, probably for the control loop or for dissipating a bit of power. Um, and we've got a capacitor underneath, that must be for filtering, that's on the AC input. Um, yeah, not too bad. I mean, the wires for the front panel are soldered directly onto the PCB, pretty common to see on this type of equipment again. Even on some of the more expensive equipment it's soldered directly in, although it would have been nice to have seen a connector there. The front panel is quite nice. It's got three four-digit seven-segment displays on the front of them, and then it's connected to the Titan Micro TM1640, which you've seen me use in a couple of projects. I think I used a similar variant on the IKEA kitchen project that I did for my son, and I also use this exact device in the humidity and temperature controller that you saw me do for my home lighting project. Really quite a nice device, it can drive a whole load of digits, does all the multiplexing for you and you just feed it in a serial waveform for the numbers that you want to display on those digits. That's driven by this microcontroller here, a Nuvoton, they're low cost 8-bit microcontrollers with our programming pins here, regulators for the various supplies, and what this is doing is it's taking the voltages that it's reading on the PCB and doing the conversion into volts, amps, and also calculating the power that's being drawn. At the bottom here we've got a couple of op amps, that's just connected to the 20 turn Born's potentiometers here, so that's the, uh, the actual calibration for the front panel. 
and the USB connector is just connected directly to this so there's no smart controller chip it won't do smart charging it's just 5 volts output but really quite a nice front panel PCB. Hiding down on the terminals to the output we have got a little capacitor here 47 microfarad 160 volts that does mean that if you, even if you have the current set right down to the very minimum you do have the potential for causing some damage if you connect something up that you didn't intend to. We've got a little bit of charge there stored in that capacitor. Electrical safety wise it's probably okay. It would be nice to have seen a few changes. So we've got an earth terminal onto a lug down here. It would have been nice to have seen this a little bit thicker and also the correct colours. But the neutral goes straight onto the PCB just here. And then the live goes all the way to the front panel to a switch and then back again. What I would have liked to have seen is these cables here tied together and maybe harnessed to the bottom of the chassis so that it's not hovering underneath the PCB. Now it does so happen that most of the components here are on the main side so not isolated and that's where these wires are but it would have been nice to have just seen these tidied up instead of flapping around like that. So I've had the power supply on full load for about five minutes now and the thermals are not looking too bad at all really. Um, about 40 degrees is the highest I've seen. The fan kicks on once the heat sinks get to about 36 but actually the warmest part in here is the current shunts as you'd expect so there's a couple of current shunts there they're about the hottest part not doing too bad at all considering that we're drawing 300 watts nothing is really getting that toasty so I'm quite impressed with the thermal efficiency of this unit it probably does mean that their 85% efficiency claim is quite valid so yeah not too bad it's definitely not a professional's power supply, more for the hobbyist, someone starting out who's got a lower budget. And like I said, if you find a 20% or 15% discount coupon, you can get it for quite a reasonable price. I think it comes in at about £45 UK. So uh, that's pretty good actually for what you're getting. And it's quite handy to have around just if you need something that can output that 10 amps every so often. It may not be your main bench power supply. But occasionally you might want to power something a bit more high power that doesn't care about the precision even though this was actually pretty good in terms of accuracy but it's a really good for that kind of thing. So let me know what you think, leave a comment down below, I'll put a link in the description to the Banggood listing if you want to take a look. There's also a few other things by this brand so similar power supplies and one that's a bit more like the the small one that we reviewed uh, the black 150 volt power supply they've got quite a few of those types. Uh, take a look at the links if you're interested, but until next time, thanks for watching.